So here's the, another view of the boat. There's the, the top view. Um, balancer. Here's the transmitter going to ground with an aerial. Here's the boat out on the water with a receiving aerial. And off it goes. So we had, uh, we call these escapements in radio control, the hobby business, you know. Colorado Springs notes, you can't see that very well, but uh, it's uh, maybe 300 pages of uh, Tesla's own notes to himself. So we can begin to see how his mind worked. It's a fascinating movie. <coughs> so we came back from Colorado with the idea of a magnifying transmitter, which is what this is. Um, so this was built um, <coughs> in Shoreham, just uh, on Long Island. And it was in ten, it was a powerhouse down at the base. And intent was to broadcast power for the benefit of mankind, so that uh, stationary and loads and uh, vehicular loads and flying loads and naval loads could all draw power from this, just as we're using here. And so the question is, what was magnified on a magnifying transmitter? Energy. Energy was magnified. The users, the subscribers, the loads, were dissipating more energy than was sourced from the power house. This was uh, initially financed by J.P. Morgan, and then when he realized that there was no place to put the meter to gain revenue, he <laughs> basically terminated the project uh, with prejudice, you might say. So this was uh, dismantled in late in World War One. I. I think this picture was uh, 1916. Not too long after that, it was dismantled because um, Tesla was bankrupted by it. And also, it was thought to be a, a target in World War One. German Navy could find New York City. Now this is a uh, not well known, I guess. In 1931. Tesla went to <coughs> Buffalo, New York, and there was a Pierce Arrow motor car there. The engine, gas engine, had been removed, and uh, an AC 80 horse motor was placed. Tesla arrived from New York City, went to a local radio store, purchased 12 vacuum tubes, wires and associated resistors, a box measuring two by one by half foot was uh, assembled by Tesla in Buffalo. The box was put in the car. Tesla did what he had to do, got in the driver's seat, and said, we now have power. They drove around Buffalo, uh, urban and rural, achieved speeds of 90 miles per hour. The car performed better than any internal combustion engine of its day. Where did the power come from? He said, from the ethers all around us. We should know, we should applied <coughs> scientists, we can by the science we've given, we haven't been given this. Boy, could we make use of this? Could we get busy and build some stuff? Could we make a difference as, as engineers? The old radio patents, you know, there's a, a picture of Marconi on the wall outside this very room. And it shouldn't be Marconi, it should be Tesla. Tesla filed his patents in 1897, <coughs> granted in 1900, and this was one of them. Marconi's uh, first application was in 1900, turned down, subsequently turned down for three years. Uh, no, no, no. Patent office in 1903 wrote to Marconi saying, many of the claims are not patentable over Tesla patents of record. The amendment to overcome said references as well as Marconi's pretended ignorance of the nature of a Tesla oscillator being little short of absurd. The term Tesla oscillator had become a household word on both continents. So Edison and Andrew Carnegie invested in Marconi, in Marconi's work. Edison became a consulting engineer. At the time, Tesla said uh, Marconi is using 17 of my patents. In 1904, the US Patent Office says, okay, Marconi's the inventor of radio. Was the fix in, do you suppose? The powers that be, the rubber barons? <coughs> you might think so. Some people think so. 
here's a book. I have it here. Wireless Telegraphy and Telephony Simply Explained, 1915, by uh, Alfred P. Morgan. And the dedication is to Nikola Tesla, whose genius has harnessed electricity to the daily work of man and whose inventions are the basis of all modern wireless transmission. This book is dedicated. That was, what, 11 years after Marconi got his bed. In 43, shortly after Tethel's death, the Supreme Court reversed the, the 1904 patent, and that was because Marconi was suing for royalties from use of radio in World War I, so they were, <laughs> they were conflicted. So, why is Marconi's photo on the wall outside this very room and not Tesla's? That's something that could be fixed, you know? This institution could actually fix that. Anybody here from that? <laughs> Could you check the, the framing of the, the video? Am I in frame? Mm -hmm. Oh. Am I okay, now the reason we're here is uh, Constantine Mile. He's a wonderful guy. I met him in 07 in Salt Lake City at Tesla Tech. Um, he's a, a fairly good English and a uh, great sense of humor. He's a very down to earth guy. He's written this book. See, it's thick, right? Close to 700 pages. And the question is, is he the Black Forest Copernicus? The, the suggestions, the, the revolution of physics uh, in his book is uh, truly astounding. It's a wonderful read. Basically, he feels that nature and electricity uses dual vortices the same as tornadoes use. Every tornado has an internal expanding vortex and an external contracting one due to the density of the water. So as a tornado moves over land and sheds the water, it loses its energy because it's lost the contracting vortex. And you're expanding and you're contracting. So Miles' perception is that electricity works that way. In fact, that's what's happening between these two transmitter and receiver. So Der Spiegel did an article in May of uh, 01 asking, <laughs> is this a black forest Copernicus? And uh, just making reference, I guess, to all his claims. Saying, so, gee, if, if Maya was correct, then this is stupendous. So now the negative articles start from mathematicians and physicists. Um, if you search the web, you'll find at least two, and I've got them here. Maybe there are more that I haven't found. I haven't found anything that really supports my own, which, I mean, it's here and it works. So it should be, should be supported. So Gerhard Brun, um, a mathematician, he's got some, some comments, and uh, towards the end, He says, there's a simple flaw of thinking. He says, uh, he accuses Ismael of uh, saying that uh, 4.7 megahertz is really 7.0 megahertz. Where should the additional number of 2.3 million waves have come from? Well, Mao never said any such thing. What he said was, he, when he tunes the excitation of the system, he finds a resonance, which you'd expect, and then another one. Well, how can a single physical structure have two resonances? Miles says, maybe that's superluminal. Because if, if there was a faster than light mechanism, that could expand, or, uh, explain the, the second resonance. Then uh, Dietrich Kulka, another uh, professor, and actually a, at the same university as Mao, a, a, a coding, um, hypothetical waveform, longitudinal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Basically, he's saying this, this is wrong, no truth to it. Never addresses the practical thing. They say things like, well, Mile is not an experimental physicist, so we don't have to look. He's working in book. Mile has written this wonderful paper called Faraday R. Maxwell. <coughs> the 
it's about 17 pages, it's well worth reading. Um, you'll read it again and again and again, and after a while, you'll get the gist of what Mal is, is saying. He calls it the Maxwell approximation. So, here's my Maxwell t-shirt. <laughs> what, uh, what didn't you understand? Mm -hmm. This bit here and this one are wrong. They're approximations, is what uh, Miles is saying. And we have video of that. <clears throat> okay. Now let's say, can the Maxwell equation be derived as a special case of a more general physics, more general world view? Also, can scalar waves be derived from this new approach? Jamie and John. So what's this about? What, is, what does it take to, I should say that in 1990, after a long Personal soldier and Miles figured out the 1997 pattern. He was able to recreate what put that lead down that was injured earlier. Um, so, this is all about a special passive antenna. Um, so, you have a, a resonant pair. The transmitter and the receiver must be built at that place. That's all set in the pattern. Um, Power is transmitted from the transmitter to the receiver, which is remarkable. There's no loss and no dispersion. We don't have systems to transmit. I mean, we lose energy on a piece of coax cable. <coughs> and, astoundingly, it's bidirectional. The transmitter can hear the receiver. In fact, if you think about it, if you're going to transmit power, the transmitter is going to have to hear the receiver to know how much power is in. So you can modulate this. We don't have any electrical physics for this. I mean, it's like uh, it's like the B that John mentioned. So here's what it is: the the underside of these print circuit boards are uh, the, the primary. It's four or five turns wound as a spiral. And the secondary on the top side is many more turns, as many as a hundred. And the more turns, the lower the resonant frequency, as you expect, is a, a longer wavelength. So the, the demonstration we have here, I guess, um, we have no inverse, inverse R squared loss of power. Um, the, the freeze transmission equation, if you think of uh, a transmitter here, sending power everywhere, it has to get, the power density has to drop, doesn't it, as the, the, the volume, the, the surface area of the sphere. So that's the origin of the inverse R squared. We don't have that here. It's as if there's a condition of space established due to this resonance induced by a spiral antenna. <coughs> 